Alexis Zoro is an Albanian American practicing artist, a designer, researcher, and writer at the University of Southern California, Roski School of Art and Design. She is the chair of Design 3D at the University of Southern California. She has shown nationally and internationally. And as part of her artwork and ongoing research project, she explores expressions of Albanian cultural identity, including significance of symbolism in the textiles, the heirlooms, um, and also and the connection to us today. Mm -hmm. And so to talk about it, I invited Alexis Zoro to the channel and she graciously accepted. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you so much. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start, pleasure to have you. Let's start here. Whether Albanians in the community know or don't, they may have something at home that you're interested in. And of course, I'm talking about the Belenza Kochare. I'm talking about Kilims or Chilim. I'm talking about tapestry or Sijade. And so what are they and what is it that you're looking for? Or Flokia or whatever they have. Yes. Flokati, yes. Um, I'm interested in looking at whatever you have. Some of it may be made by a family member. It might be old. It might be relatively new. Um, it could have come from a factory in Albania. From uh, It could be uh, from really... Any area of Albania, I'm, I'm open and interested in learning as much as I can. I've been to, to Albania, I've traveled around. I haven't been able to go absolutely everywhere, but I've gone to a lot of places to see a lot of differences. And I'm always wanting to learn more, see more, and certainly hear stories about it. And also, especially for people who maybe know how to weave is always really interesting and how they learned how to make the dyes or did they get, are they chemical dyes? Cause I've met people who actually know how to make their own dyes out of their garden. So that was also really wonderful. I'm open to everything. I want to learn everything I can. Okay. If we may jump a little bit back mm -hmm. to maybe November of 2022, Yes. The, um, so I'm just going to go back just to ask you about the, um, the it was a, a panel hosted by the Society <laughs> of Albanian Studies. Yes. Big, and uh, it was to discuss the, the changes of the Albanian diaspora and the Albanian American relations. So yes. You do the presentation. So what were the main points, if you can sum it up? Yes. Um, I was presenting this, uh, the work that I did. I met with... Uh, the community, the parish of St. George and in Boston and St. Mary's in Worcester. And I re reached out to both churches and asked to um, the community if they would be willing to share uh, their heirlooms, any kind of textiles and or other kinds of heirlooms. And so I got to see a lot of different things not just the uh, Lavenza and the Valenza. <laughs> it's, they, but the thing that's funny about the, that is, is that I also did work in Albania a few years ago. I got a grant to do that work. And through my research, I learned that there's many names for that particular item. My yes. cousins call it Valenska. And, um, but that's, uh, that's how they know it. And that's how I learned it. But um, but it's been Lovens, Valens. It's spelled a million different ways that you could possibly imagine. And you introduced me to another term because I've never heard Kochare attached to it. So that's a new one for me. So um, like I said, I'm always interested to learn. So when I was presenting that, I wanted to sort of talk about um, one, that there are all these differences. Two, that they are incredibly beautiful handmade items. Uh, three, there are several different kinds of designs that I've seen, one being very common that has the jamin, um, the mosque symbol, which some people didn't even know was called a mosque symbol. Um, 
Some people think of it as a tree of life. It has other names in other countries. Um, but the other thing is, is that particular design, you see it, at, you know, the size of maybe like a double bed or a queen size bed, like the top of it, but you also see cradle covers. And the, um, I was told by different people that it's for good luck. It's in, it's been in people's paya, but also, it's a reflection of the weaver it's themselves, because some of them are very complex, many colors, really intricate designs. Some are more simple with red and black or red and navy, dark blue. Um, but then there are other designs that are common that are particular to um, Korcha and um, Butrint. No, not Butrint, excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Berat? Barats, thank you. I have cousins there too. Um, <laughs> yes, and Barats. So I, it, that's been interesting because there's like single colors. There's, uh, you know, certain things that are very common. And then, the, you know, in the uh, when I was in Albania looking at the national collection, I got to see some pieces that were I'd never seen before. And then when I was in Worcester, I saw one particular one that I had never seen before, not in Albania, not anywhere that was oh my goodness, probably from the late 1800s, I imagine. It was really unusual design, beautifully made uh, piece. So uh, that's I'm excited to discover everything I can about all this work. And, and the piece that you found there, is that in connection to the project that the students or the university, um, the, um, the Polytech University? So there's a project that the students are doing with the museum, the Ulster Museum of History. I know that because there was an exhibition and that they're still working on it. And it's a big I, I don't know anything about that. Oh, okay. Nothing. So maybe there's but more here for there, later. I'm sure there's more. And then okay. another thing that I discovered is some of them are embroidered, like the one that belonged to the Kurjali family had actually a Greek theta yes. embroidered, but others have their name on it. And the other thing I wanted to point out that is really, I found incredibly beautiful about St. George's in particular, um, that came from, it's the tradition started with Father Lyolin, is um, that he would take those beautiful um, textiles and adorn sacred spaces with them, which I thought was really extraordinary because one, it is uh, a relationship of the intimacy of and the specialness of one's relationship to their religion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very intimate uh, experience having a religion and practicing and worshiping, right? But also for newcomers from, you know, the 90s, 2000s, that you see something that immediately you can relate to from home. So it's not just people speaking the language, but the actual items themselves um, that you're like, wow, that's, something from home. So I just, I thought that was really beautiful and very unique to that particular church. I mean, there's a lot of things very unique about that church, <laughs> historically speaking, but um, I just thought that was a very beautiful gesture. Yes, thank you, actually. I did not know. When you said Father Lylan started the tradition, is that, what tradition? The, the tradition of- Well, I think what design? happened- I think it's my understanding that uh, people, the members of the parish yes. would donate their, um, their uh, Valenza, their Chilima to the church. And so they actually have quite a collection, believe it or not. And I was, they were very generous to allow me to look at them and photograph them. And um, so and this is part of your ongoing project, Alexis. This well, this is, is this is part, part of, of like an ongoing research. Okay. Yes. And that eventually, maybe someday I'll be able to write a book to share with everybody. But now they're just in paper form and published that way. Okay. So now we've come to the point when we want to unpack the Albanian ancestry, right? Yes. It is very present in your work, as we have <laughs> discussed. And then you admit it, you you say yes and what can you tell us a bit about the albanian ancestry and how it has shaped as you say who you are today or sure uh my my grandparents 
came to the United States in 1939. Um, and Did they come from Korcha. <laughs> yes. Okay. My grandmother originally was from Pogradets and then moved to Korcha. Um, and my grandfather was from Korcha. And um, so, yeah, they came. Uh, and the story goes that, uh, you know, they were the last boat out and, you know, they would t share stories of, you know, hearing bombs and knowing there's sub submarines in the water. And I, I am eternally grateful for all that they did to make my life possible. And um, <clears throat> so I grew up with in my in the Washington, D.C. area with my mom and dad. And so we would go, my mother and I would go regularly to Philadelphia to, um, I was born in Philadelphia, to visit. And so I was, you know, baptized in that church and was in that community growing up. And it was a huge part of my life, being around the, the language, the religion, the food. Um, <clears throat> it was, uh, my, my grandmother's house was like paradise for me and <laughs> everything, the kitchen, her sewing box, everything that she did, the way she would talk to me. And I remember uh, when I took Albanian lessons, Albanian language lessons um, with the most wonderful lady, Linda Maniku. Um, and I was telling her about how my grandmother would talk to me and she was like, oh, that's so typical of that era, that area. And I know how that is. I know how grandmothers can talk like that and <laughs> yes so now what i know we talked about a little bit about the the albanian customs yeah growing up with albanian or in the culture surrounded yeah. by albanian customs such as one that you said was name what day is name day you know observing name day and the others or your friends wouldn't know what you're talking yeah. about. What, what, what was that like? If you can take us back in that time. Uh, well, they were always a wonderful, fun uh, party, really. And um, my favorite part was, you know, everybody, all these people from the, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins, everybody piled in at my grandmother's house and everybody's eating and talking and joking around. And then at a certain point, you know, one of my favorite memories is, uh, you know, being sent to get the coffee cups because they would drink the real coffee. And then we would, I would be, you know, cause we'd be cleaning up and the men would be still talking around the table and smoking and drinking and whatever. And I, they would, you know, turn the cup over and read the grounds and start laughing and gossiping. And I just, I just loved it. It was just wonderful. So do you recall the first encounter with uh, the heirlooms? And, and I know you told me that it wasn't at your grandmother's house. Right. It wasn't. It was at my, well, it's funny because um, I was, it all, this whole thing started at a family reunion, seeing this incredible book called um, Chilima Scriptare by Rok Zoizi. And um, that sort of started the whole investigation. I was really curious about the book. And then another cousin showed me an heirloom that belonged to my great grandmother, which basically started this whole investigation and applying for a particular grant to go to Albania to do the work. And then as I was starting to talk to my family about it, I remembered being really little at my a cousin's house who had a it's a very typical chilima from Korcha that has um sometimes it's called an eye dazzler it's you know with the concentric uh geometric design around and around sometimes it's called other things depending upon what country you're in and then the border had the um the jamin uh motif around it and it was brightly colored and I remember I remembered you know playing on it with Legos and lining it up with the <laughs> with the design um as a little girl and so then it was like this whole kind of bringing everything back together mm -hmm. 
So now maybe it's the moment to talk about the the mask because you mentioned it um, yes. motif, but I do want to come back to the point of your your story of your family story. Mm. So, but we can explore the li a little bit more the symbolism of uh, the mask found in the the heirlooms found in the Albanian Orthodox families that were, as you say, possibly brought them with them here. Yeah, brought them here. So, what does it, why should we care about it, and what does it mean? I think it's a window, well, I believe that it's a window into uh, identity and um, also an heritage that um, is unique. Albania is a unique country. It's been occupied, as we know, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, and yet it managed to hold on to its language. Therefore, it also held on to other traditions, dress, things like this. So all of these items are an insight into the past. It's a window into the past and especially things that are from around the home that are domestic items, I think are really very special and sometimes overlooked because it's women's work that often made it. Women made these pieces and they're made by hand. And there's a lot of time and effort involved in making these pieces. It's a lot of labor and, um, a lot of know-how. So I think it's when you see them, unfortunately, they're they're not well documented like they are in other countries like Romania or Serbia or Bulgaria. And as a result, Albanian um, textiles don't sell for nearly as much money as their neighbors. And a part of that is also documentation and understanding that there's a market there for collectors. They just don't know enough about it. And um, Albanians need to know about it and treasure it and and love them. That's what I think. <laughs> that that's that segues well with the story of your family as um, going back to, as you said, the 1939s. You know, the, mm -hmm. as is the case with many, uh, uh, you know, immigrant families. But let's just say the Albanian families were separated. Yes. Um, both sides of the Atlantic, members yes. of the family. So what was that like? And then we will bring it to the times that, you know, what was the, the, the impact of the living under a, a strict communist mm. regime, you know, systems? Uh -huh. um, well, I remember from a very young age that, um, you know, Albania was very mysterious. I remember you know, being really curious about it. And, you know, my grandmother telling me stories about how beautiful Korcha was. And, um, but I also remember the secrecy and fear, a lot of secrecy and fear around, you know, people whispering, trying to get people out of Albania at that time, people disappearing, families being wiped out or put into camps, labor camps. Um, we would write letters to cousins and uh, put together care packages full of clothes and vitamins and, you know, Tylenol and stuff like that and send it off. And, you know, I know we knew that letters were read and, you know, and then of course we, I learned later when I was older about how, you know, probably most of the stuff we sent did not arrive to the people <laughs> who were supposed to get it. But um but I, I, that was a really um, important part of my upbringing. And that also made me feel very exotic because I, you know, I knew a lot of Greek people, but I didn't know a lot of Albanian people except for the people at the church. So, and because I lived in Washington, DC, I, I really didn't know any other Albanians. Um, and so um, I would only see them when I was in Philadelphia. When you say church, which church do you mean? In, What's in the name uh, of the church? In Philadelphia, Philadelphia? Uh -huh. St. John Christendom, St. Okay. John's Christendom. Okay. And then there's the other one is St. Peter and Paul, which um, is the other church in Philadelphia. That's a whole other project that I'm really yes. interested in, <laughs> is churches, mosques, and cultural centers in the United States, Albanian ones. I'm working on that too. <laughs> yes. So what have you discovered in the, what are some of the things that you have discovered in the course of your work? And if you will, what secrets do they hold? These heirlooms, oh. if you can go more into 
the stories that they say to us, you know, the stories of the heirlooms? Well, um, there's a lot there, actually. Um, Part of it is there's, you have to kind of think of, well, I think of it as the pre-World War II era. Yes. And then there's the era that is when Albania was a closed state, police state. And then after when in the 90s, 2000s. So as a result, there's multiple things to look at. So there's things that were made at home by home weavers. There are things that were made by professional weavers. And then obviously when Albania was um, a police state, they actually had a very thriving, large factory system. And when I say factory, the Kaleems, everything was made by hand. It just was like centralized where a lot of women were making these items by hand um, and they were working as fast as they can to produce these these objects for sale, which I learned, I was shocked because I did not even know that that was the case um, growing up, you know, because we were just said, nobody gets in, nobody gets out, nothing, you know, gets out. You know, you occasionally would see like uh, I, at my grandmother's house, we had a, a book that was, you know, read with women with guns, which I thought was really cool <laughs> growing up. But, um, uh, you know, that was about it. Did I answer your question? Yes, I think so. It was, the, as I said, I wanted to get into the part of how, how no part of life was spared, the indoctrination. Oh yeah. Well, that's that, that gets out to how these this, these products were in fact, you know. Yes. So, to, that's to, true. So that that leads to a, an interesting wrinkle with the investigation that I've been involved in, which is the um, the meanings of the colors and the designs, and talking with different people about them. So there's a lot of information about these, some of these designs because they're in common with con- other countries that were part of the Ottoman Empire. But obviously Albania does it a little different, just like Bulgaria does it their way, Albania does it their way, Serbia does it their way, but there's similarities. So um, in talking with people, I learned a lot of things. One is that um, when this whole thing got started, uh, I asked for a lot of help from family and connections. And I remember talking to a cousin who was who grew up in Tirana, who's like my age. She was like, well, of course I'll help you, but I don't know what you see in it. Cause you know, she basically was saying that it that all folk culture was shoved down her throat growing up and she couldn't bear to look at it ever again. And that was a huge insight because that sort of first clue kind of unfolded when I actually did the work in Albania because first of all, uh, you could see how some of these items, for example, were identified, these symbols were identified as um, a double-headed eagle, but you know, it didn't, some of that, those identifications didn't make sense. Sometimes it was, I don't, you know, why does it have to mean anything? And the reality is, is that a lot of these symbols come from an aspirational place. A lot of them have to do in the past, I'm talking about the way past, Mm -hmm. in antiquity, it would be aspirational, like for happy life, for fertility, for luck, for um, a beautiful garden, uh, you know, a happy big family. So a lot of those kinds of things would be present in a lot of weaving in the past. I'm sorry, why do you say it didn't make sense for the double-headed eagle? Because some of them did not look like double-headed eagles, one. And two, it just seemed like there were just way too many. It just seemed bizarre that everything was a double-headed eagle all the time, double-headed eagle. And unfortunately, I think I may have offended some people, but I didn't mean to. It's really just an observation that, you know, I can understand if it were, you know, in resistance um, that you'd want to have a lot of that symbol, like when Albania was seeking independence to have a lot of that symbol to kind of uh, Mm -hmm. rouse people. But to me, my interpretation is that perhaps it is a reflection of the dogma from the dictator and that a lot of the information of meaning was 
removed and replaced with other meaning. And then on top of that, the factory system, um, I feel may have also contributed to that as well. I think that's where the home weaver um, and the uh, heirlooms are really in, in full of information because there are certain things that kind of stuck. For example, there are certain colors and, and designs that only people from the South of Albania do. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that only people in Kukas do and have symbols and colors in their uh, textiles. So there's certainly differences, but um, you know, I would never see somebody uh, doing the reverse, but there are certain designs that you would see both in the North and the South, which I thought was kind of interesting. But like I said, I, I, there's so much more for me to learn and um, I hope to have the opportunity to go back and do more research and to also do more research in Kosovo and also in some of the areas around Albania and other countries. So if I understand it correctly, these heirlooms or textiles, they do bear, they have a reg cultural, regional identities yes. in each cultural, so in each region. But at the same time, they have commonalities. They have mm -hmm. common, mm -hmm. and so, but I want to understand a bit more if, and I, I also am curious about the name, if it has, if it's recognized as, you said it has many different variations of the, but, would it have the same status as a uh, flocati, which everybody would know when we when we say it? I'm not, I'm, I'm just an outsider from, but but I would know what it is. So when you say it in your industry, in the that when you say Valenza or Levenza or the, the, is it recognized? Do people know what it is or what you're referring to? Uh, no. Um... I have to define my terms okay. uh, when I'm speaking to people, colleagues that are in art and design um, and academics, I have to define it and explain more often than not, it is uh, wool that has been woven, both the warp and the weft are wool and that um, it's then felted so that it's incredibly warm. That's why people in Massachusetts love it because it keeps them nice and warm mm -hmm. and um, and obviously in Korcha, it gets cold, it snows there, it's warm. It, and, um, but I do, but I also, the thing that's interesting about those is that, for example, the Vlach people have, I have been told, have some that are made out of goat hair or goat and sheep hair. But again, I don't know enough about it to speak on it. I have, that's yet another area I need to learn about. And the distinction would be, or because they're not normally made out of goat hair, they're... Well, the materials tell a lot about the object. So sometimes you'll see wool being made both for the warp and the weft, sometimes, which means both directions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's cotton and then wool. Sometimes it's goat hair and wool. So you, you kind of want to make note of what the process is, just like you make a note of process of, I mean, this is getting technical, but like the dyes, are they natural dyes? Are they chemical dyes? Because that can also give you an indication as to how old it might be. And um, so for example, in some people's homes, I saw it a lot that were mixed, like some were made with both vegetable dyes and chemical dyes, which was really beautiful. And um, so it's just really interesting to see how people pro solve problems and then how do they come up with their designs? Because if you think about it, it's really remarkable because people have been weaving forever since the beginning of time when they figured out how to spin and, and make clothes for themselves that that's been going on forever. And it's all over the world. People have been doing this. And then you think to yourself, how did they do that? How do they know they're chemists? Because they know how to make all these dyes. They're scientists. They're brilliant women, usually, because they have to know how to do the design and how to plan it out. It's very mathematical. And they're doing this while they're raising a family. And it's incredible. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for that. And then, and then, of course, then... Like I, I think I had said to you before that, um, you know, in speaking with somebody like Dr. 
um, I mean, Professor Aphrodite Onuzi, who uh, you may recognize because she was very involved with the um, Jubleta being recognized by UNESCO, talked and shared with me that a lot of times it was weaving a story. You're telling a story, but it's through weaving. And I feel I, you can see that with a lot of these um, beautiful heirlooms that might be in people's homes right now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And so two questions here. Yes. When did you know or had the first inspiration to tell your story through your artwork, as, as they, the weavers would say it in their Valenza <laughs> or artwork? And also later, I just want to make the comparison because uh, there are no longer, Valenzas are no longer weaved or made in right. Albania. You said right. that. Whereas in, as of November 2022, Jubleta was recognized and got protection status from UNESCO. So right. first, I'm, I'm sorry, it was too convoluted. <laughs> it's two no. parts. Your story and then how Jubleta is, in fact, now got the protection status that Valenza doesn't have. So um, the symbols and motifs the first thing I did was I started with the one that belonged to my great grandmother, which I found extraordinary. First of all, I was intrigued because she managed to maintain her religious orthodoxy while being in communist Albania, atheist Albania. And, but yet she had a kilim that had mosques on it. And I thought to myself, what is that about? And so that kind of piqued my curiosity. And so then I started to use some of the imagery from her uh, Kilim in my own artwork. And then as I started to do that, I started to feel kind of funny about it because it's like, how could I be using these symbols without fully understanding what they mean? That's not right. So that's what started a deeper investigation. And in fact, I actually have <laughs> the the one from my grandmother's um Kilim is tattooed on my arm because it's so oh, special. Is, is it possible to show it? Or sure. not? Okay. Can oh. you see? Yes. Yes, I can. It was on Albanian national television when I was there getting interviewed there. <laughs> a, a picture of you, the, the tattoo? Yeah. Yeah. They were surprised that I had a tattoo, but it's very, uh, first of all, the object itself was absolutely incredible to me, just the quality of the materials, the quality and craftsmanship, the design. Uh, it was just so beautiful, beautifully made. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have a picture of it? Of the No, no, I don't. Not handy. But, you know, I also did not see anything. I saw I did not see um, anything quite like it when I was in Albania. And that was really interesting to me uh, because part of what was really interesting was as I was investigating the mosque symbol um, was, you know, the idea of this interfaith possibility, because like my faith, my family has interfaith, there's Bektashi and Orthodox in my family. And I know that's very common for people in Southern Albania uh, roots. Um, there's a lot of mix. And I think that's a really amazingly beautiful thing about Albanian culture. And so, um, but inside the mosque, there's sometimes is a little figure. Sometimes it's a rooster or an ibrik or uh, a vase. Sometimes it looks like an animal. And um, so that was another thing I was constantly trying to find out more information and trying to do research about that. And then, cause the one that's inside my grandmother, my great grandmother's, I haven't seen in any other piece. And I think it's just cause it's really old. Oh, sorry. That's okay. We love dogs. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, how were you able to tell the tattoo artist then uh, to? I drew so, it. Okay, you drew it yourself. I design all my tattoos, and then she she does she puts it on me. <laughs> I see. Okay, that's good to know. Um, <laughs> now, oh, I, now we want to explore more about you as an artist, as a, yes. because you told the story of your family. And so yeah. now we'll, let's start with um, you were recognized or let me just see what, how it is. It was worded here as the cultural, you are named a cultural trailblazer by the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. 
what does that entail? And what uh, would you like to be a cultural tra trailblazer? <laughs> uh, I think it's because uh, the kind of work that I'm doing is unique and that, you know, I think it's also a reflection of Los Angeles being this incredibly dynamic city full of people from all over the world, bringing their food and culture and art here. So I, I, I'm in very good company and delighted to be so. This is the one that's from LAX. This is what we were talking about. Um, as you can see, it's very large. It's 72 feet long. But it's not one piece. It's one mural. Mural, okay. And it's uh, made with house paint and vinyl and mylar. And so I tried to use some colors that you would find in multiple regions, but they're not true to the region. Some things are, some things aren't. So I kind of really try to mix it up a little bit so that there's no, there's a ways to kind of open things up for conversation. So here's a close up. And these were all taken from my research and seeing the actual pieces themselves. I mean, this is a very common one um, that is in more northern and middle Albania. And sometimes it's a, a you see in Serbia. Mm -hmm. And that's um, this one here is called the Belgrade key in the gold here is that's how some people identify it. But I saw the, you know, that was in like the Kruja Ethnographic Museum. And I just photographed it and traced it and made it into a file. So um, there you can see it right there. But again, it's, you know, the thing about identifying symbols is also very interesting because, you know, we see that, you know, is it Greek salad or Albanian salad? Is it Greek coffee or Turkish coffee or Albanian coffee? Like all these things that are labels that we get used to. So it's just, just something to look at and be aware of. But um, another project I did was, um, this was my weaving, because when I was talking to weavers, I, you know, as they were telling me about their stories, I was like, I really need to see what this is like physically. And these are much smaller than what they make. But I was really interested in the concept of mashallah, because mm -hmm. I certainly heard that growing up my whole life. And, um, and I was really moved by the concept, right, that you're wishing for protection, essentially, and that this is something that crosses all borders, geopolitical, religious, cultural, language, all so many borders. So um, I started doing it in different languages. So right there, you can see this is in Northern Macedonian, Turkish, Albanian or English, Masha Allah is the English translation of the Arabic, and I did it in Arabic, I did it in Greek, so that's an ongoing series. I'm sorry, that, that is not at the airport. This, these pieces are... In yeah, these are, these were shown at, at, at different galleries and stuff shows. like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, when I, the other thing I wanted to show you is, so these are some of my tapestries, but I wanted to show you because I've started to also do Albanian language tapestries. So this was the first one I did, which I was playing with the idea what does it of... Chto pil kadera. <laughs> really uh, looking at idiomatic phrases, which again is an ongoing. So um, I, I like idiomatic phrases and I feel like that's another window into culture, right? Yes. Um, we in, in America, it's the grass is always greener, but that's a more positive, right? But you know, it's things like that, that I think are really uh, wonderful. Gotta you move. anticipated my, I was going to say, what would be the equivalent idiomatic expression uh -huh. in English? But So this I, was one that my grandmother would tell my mother, Coco Ben, Coco Pastor. Oh, Coca Ben Coca Fasson, yes. <laughs> um, and so that's another. So I've been playing with again language, and that's a. I've been collecting phrases and um, idiomatic phrases. Would that, would that be you reap what you saw? Uh, like kind of, yeah. I guess that would. That's yeah. That's probably the equivalent. Although I don't know. I feel like it's more. <laughs> Well, which one would you use for a, tr a translation, a rough one? No, no, no. You, I think you're right. I don't know. I mean, because the head, the literal translation, the head does, the head follows is it doesn't mean anything, but, uh, you know, it doesn't have the same feeling that you, you reap what you sow is, yeah, I think the best way, best way. So those were some of my Albanian language ones that I've been trying to play with. And, um, and then I also um, uh, did some... Ones that were more, oh, this is the Greek version of mashallah. And um, I've also done things where I upcycle materials. So this is all old ribbon, packing material, 
uh, shoe, dirty shoelaces, all kinds of things like this mixed in to make this tapestry. Also um, dry cleaning bags, which I would spin into a yarn, but it's not yarn. A yarn. Know, which, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I can also show you the debut. So this is the motif that was from my great grandmother's killing. And yes. as you can see, it's got a different in- thing inside there. And this was shown in uh, Venice, Italy. And um, this was the first time I ever used it in the public setting. And that was really interesting because Italians and, you know, that international crowd, again, never guessed it was Albanian. <laughs> they, uh, you know, thought Turkish or Pakistani or, you know, other things. Uh, just, what is it? What's the material? So this is uh, the red is gold is red vinyl and the gold is mylar. And then uh, there's a plaster sculpture in the middle with a chandelier on top. And then there's gold, more gold uh, motifs. And there's a hot pink motif that kind of looks like a heart. Um, But it also kind of reminds me of a goddess symbol over there. That's this piece, which was really an honor to to do that. That's just another view of it. And an homage to your great grandmother. And it was called Life is Relentless, for good or bad, right? Life is Relentless. So that's, I'll end here. Unless you wanted to see more of my stuff, this is the the piece in the air. Also, is there, uh, I know you mentioned a couple of things you're doing with Richard. You are working on a, a paper that is going to be published and also other projects that you're working on. But- yes, I have the paper, which is going to be published. I have not heard yet when, but it is coming out in 2023 in a journal of Balkan material culture. And then I am working on collecting information about Albanian American diaspora and such cultural intu- institutions like churches, mosques and cultural centers and language centers. Um, So I've been gathering information about that. And then um, I have some exhibitions pending, but no no firm details yet to share, but hopefully, you know, soon I'll have an idea. Yes, as we say, inshallah. (laughs) Yes, exactly. God willing. Exactly, God willing. This is another aspect of my work, which is I keep a collage book with colors and patterns to mix together. So this is, I have one book that's just totally about collages. And so this is part of like my process and coming up with colors and patterns. And then I have a separate book that I keep like my sketches and notes. And, um, and then I also have stuff on the computer, but this is kind of fun because it's, you know, just being hands-on and sometimes I do it with my daughter and I will make collages together. Yes, that's fun. Sounds like fun. And this is like, you know, all those uh, privacy envelopes from the bank and stuff like that. This is just using those with images from from the magazine. So everybody can do it. (laughs) There's no no trick to it. And I'll show you. um, This is another one of my favorites. That's um, this uh, I did during the quarantine. And I I just um, I like this one because it has so many different kinds of textures and um, colors. And a lot of the colors are. I don't know. They're they, they're nice and bright and cheerful. And how long did that one take when you start? Well, during the pandemic, I was much more productive because I didn't have all the distractions of driving yes. one kid here and picking up another kid there and soccer practice and blah blah blah. But so I was able to do a, a you know one in like a few weeks, and now it takes a much longer because like keeps you busy. And here's here's the mash, masha Allah, but in Arabic, because we had shown the, I showed you the Greek and the Turkish and the other. So I try to, um, it was really wonderful to be able to show those all together here in, in Los Angeles. And this one is fun too, because this one, I used my kids' old jeans. That These are like, you know, jeans that I cut up. And then I had some other kinds of stuff from an old, um, sweater, like a chenille sweater that was falling apart. And so I use that to weave and some other materials just to mix it up and play with it. Do you get a lot of requests from other moms to, to do the same? Do you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but, yeah. but as a result, you know, um, it's been great to be able to talk to my children about being able to use Indeed. and reuse materials Yes, yes. because here in this one, this one is all, this is all dry cleaner bags. And this is all this part. And, and this part up here, we're all with dry cleaner bags that I spun, you know, you get so many of those sometimes. And then it's like, what are you going to do with it? It's, I don't want to put it in the garbage. So here I'm (laughs) using it for something else. 
home economics. And also at the university, what is the level of interest of students in terms of exploring more of the, uh, yes, you know, the art and designs, but also in going into maybe, you know, Albania and discovering more about Albanian culture? Well, there is a tremendous interest in textiles. There's a tremendous interest in sustainability, which I use a lot of that in my own practice, as I showed you. So so there's a really good connection there with students wanting to learn about textiles and weaving and sustainability. And it's a great way to have that kind of conversation that really any material can be used. You can spin paper, you can spin lots of things, you can you know, everything can be turned into a material that can be transformed into something else. And that's the wonderful thing about the world that I live in, in art and design, we get to play with all kinds of stuff like that. Yes. When I posted this on Facebook, a lot of my friends in Albania were like, you're so funny. (laughs) (laughs) But hopefully I'll be able to get more of these done and get them out into the world. Yes, yes. How does that happen? Do you put them on your link? Yes, or- I have it on my website and then, but also just to have the, you know, time to make them. So every time I'm not, I'm off from teaching, I'm making. And so that's, that's usually how it goes for me. I'm just trying to balance those things like all working mothers do trying to try to manage everything as best you can. <laughs> but it's your own sort of like entrepreneurial drive or do you get any company any agencies to work with you or you know the media's interest in this um there's been some media interest in it and uh one of my pieces is going is going to new york city in the rockefeller foundation headquarters which is really nice i mean that's a real honor um but you know for me i'm not that interested (laughs) you know my 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 family would think i say i'm being stupid uh, but um, I, I don't, um, I'm the, it, money doesn't drive me. It's, it's right, right. making and, and communicating the advertising part. It's just, <laughs> I'm just like, no, I just want to make it and share it with people. That's all I really care about. And having conversations and hearing people's stories. That's the best thing for me. If the money comes, that's a beautiful thing too, but you know, that's not, that's not the number one priority for me. But let's just say that this one is it, there is a market for it. Evidently. Sure. Yeah. So the reason why I I was intrigued by the um, your work at the at the airport is that because because it's an entry point for yes. for people and among them yes. did did that factor in? Did you feel differently about this project in, in comparison to others? I thought about that a lot because yeah. of. Um, I, I think that's also why I, I chose to incorporate a lot of different motifs from different areas and regions in Albania into the one piece. And so people who know something would recognize that there's, there's motifs from different places. But also, I think for me, the other thing that uh, means a lot to me is that, you know, it's not like my family grew up going to... Uh, sorry, uh, going to museums or anything like that. And to, you know, this is something that is for a much bigger audience, not an art going audience. And so it's really the idea of being able to um, think about not just the people who work there who are going to have to see it every day, all day, every day, but also to, you know, really um, have a conversation, people who might recognize motifs, but maybe it's not, um, they don't realize it's from Albania. Maybe they think it's Navajo. Maybe they think it's Guatemalan. Maybe they think it's Turkish. So it's an opportunity. It's an entry point to also have this conversation of this shared experience of, of textiles and weaving that is completely global. And that there's these connections that are really special across all people, right? So to me, like I, I, I love having those opportunities to talk about that. And then, of course, the American experience of immigrants and coming to this country and dealing with acculturation is also really fascinating. So it's really an opportunity to have a conversation about a lot of things. And so, although this is our first interview, <laughs> it's at this channel, um, the Daily News. You, your connections with Vatra yeah. go way back, or your family connections yes. with Vatra go way back to the time of Noli and the time of Vatra's founding in Boston. 
Yeah. What can you tell us a bit more about? Uh, well, what I can tell you is, is that my, um, some of you may know the Chikani family or the uh, Kurjali family. Those are cousins. And, um, and then my family, the Zoto family, which um, have been actively involved in, in all things Albanian <laughs> and the Albanian um, American conferences and things like this. I mean, my mom used to tell me about going to those conferences. So, um, but they, uh, you know, my, like the cousins, the Kurjali and Chikani families were here before my grandparents got here and were, were trying to form, you know, uh, an opportunity to practice their religion and their language. It's, it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable thing. And um, like I said, I'm incredibly grateful also because, you know, all these, all this information, there's no way I could have ever had access to any of it without their help and without their incredible generosity and saying, oh, you need to talk to these people when you go to Pokhara Debts and, oh, you need to talk to these people when you're in Tirana and these people, you got to talk to them. And so they're just incredible. I, it's, I don't know what else to say. I'm just really incredibly grateful. Yes. You can never do anything on your own. You always no. need help of others. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, and so to bring it together, what do all of these heirlooms and the, the tapestries and the villains and the, what do they say about us today? Who are we, hmm. in other words, as a people and a culture? Well, um, that's kind of tricky because I'm, I'm speaking as an Albanian American, right. Who's also, I mean, I haven't lived in Albania and I certainly did not survive uh, some of the horrific things that occurred there. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think that there's a lot of, there's parts of the population of Albania that are fully traumatized from that. And it's an opportunity to look at this thing of beauty, to connect to heritage and to think about what, what kind of future you wanna build and what part of those aspects of the identity do you wanna put, put forward into the future? Because um, you know, trying to explain what happened in Albania to my family, to my children was, incredibly difficult. And so when I took them to Tirana, we did go to the, the House of Leaves Museum so that I could try to show them because it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's so hard to explain and it seems completely impossible to understand. And yet <laughs> the other thing that was shocking to me was to find people, young people who had no concept of their history and what happened during that time, let alone working in diaspora communities and having this conflict that followed them to the United States with people who were former jailers and the people who were incarcerated sort of butting heads into each other in these communities. So um, I feel like uh, everybody has things in their house that are very domestic, they're very quotidian, but they also are things of beauty that can connect people and have conversations. And, um, you know, honestly, I, I hope to God that at some point there will be an opportunity for truth and reconciliation to have an understanding about what happened and to have, you know, the people who are seeking justice to have their justice, to be able to have their peace. I mean, but I, I'm an outsider, so it's, I'm sure it's none of my business, but I, I just see the heartbreak in it and it, it really gets me. Well, thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for talking to us about it. So today we were introduced to Alexis Zoto. She is an Albanian American practicing artist, designer, and researcher and in her artwork as well as in her ongoing heritage research. She explores expressions of Albanian cultural identity, the significance of symbolism, and that is something that connects all of us and something that we are profoundly grateful for, her work, so, and that's so, that. <laughs> so Thank yeah. you.
Thank you. Thank you.